Hello again, and welcome back to APHA's 15 on COVID-19 series. Today, we're going to be talking about remdesivir. My name is Dan Zlot. I'm the Vice President of Education here at APHA. We're so glad you joined us. Let's go ahead and dig in. As usual, I have nothing to disclose. And the learning objectives for today, at the end of the activity, you should be able to discuss the latest developments related to COVID-19. All right, so we've all been hearing a lot about uh, different potential treatments for COVID-19, um, everything from hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin uh, to this drug, remdesivir. Um, and so here's the chemical structure of remdesivir for you, and we'll dig into that in a little bit more detail later on. Um, but it turns out that remdesivir is a repurposed Ebola drug. Uh, it was um, first described by Gilead, uh, and you may also hear it referred to as GS5734. Um, that's not uncommon for drugs in early phase trials to only have a number like that, so just be aware that um, you may hear that as well. Most people refer to it as remdesivir, however. Um, it was developed in response to the Ebola outbreak, uh, and the first literature reports of remdesivir start to appear in 2015-2016. Um, in preclinical trials, um, so that would be you know either the lab-based stuff where you're looking at um, cell cultures, looking at viral entry into cell cultures, and then in animal models, um, remdesivir showed significant promise against Ebola. However, the clinical trials were pretty disappointing. Uh, and in fact, one trial randomizing patients to four different treatments for Ebola um, was actually stopped early. At least two of the arms were stopped early because of lack of efficacy. And one of the arms that was stopped early was the remdesivir arm. Um, so kind of interesting there. Um, however, because of how significant the effects were in vitro, again, mostly in cell lines, um, scientists began exploring its effectiveness against other viruses. And of great interest to the COVID-19 crisis was some of the data coming out about the efficacy of remdesivir in SARS and MERS, as well as other uh, common coronaviruses that cause uh, human infection. So remdesivir is currently only available in clinical studies or on an expanded use basis. So if your institution is not part of a clinical trial or able to um, get drug on the expanded use basis, um, there may be some hurdles for you to gain access to remdesivir. So we'll just uh, throw that out there up front. We'll touch on that again at the end. All right, so how exactly does remdesivir work? What's the mechanism of action? Uh, let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about you know, DNA and RNA uh, and um, some of the interesting mechanisms that remdesivir has. So remdesivir, is a, to start off with, is an adenosine analog. So the image there is adenine, which is one of the building blocks for adenosine. Uh, it turns out that adenine can either be bound to ribose and become adenosine. So again, um, RNA, right, ribonucleic acid, that becomes from the ribose. Um, the other thing that's interesting about adenosine, of course, is it's the, one of the backbones for our cellular metabolism. Um, adenosine can be phosphorylated and become adenosine triphosphate, which is one of the major drivers of um, energy, if you will, um, in again, in cellular metabolism. So adenosine plays a hugely important role for us. Um, Additionally, uh, adenosine can exist in a monophosphate form and has all kinds of implications there with um, adenosine monophosphate, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, et cetera. Um, that's beyond the scope of today's discussion, but do know that this is at the core uh, of the way that our cells work. So um, finding a, a drug that works against this without having significant toxicity can be a little bit challenging. Um, remdesivir has done that. So uh, we'll walk through that. The other thing that can happen, of course, is that you can bind adenine to deoxyribose and get deoxyadenosine, which then gets incorporated and becomes DNA. Um, so again, deoxyribonucleic acid, and that's where the deoxy comes from. Um, so returning to remdesivir, uh, remdesivir selectively binds to viral RNA polymerase. And recall that polymerases are enzymes that uh, basically build RNA or DNA chains. Uh, in the case of SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, uh, it's a RNA-based virus. So we're going to be talking a lot about RNA. And so the polymerase um, there is designed to build RNA strands. 
Um, so what happens is remdesivir looks so much like uh, adenosine. And again, we'll, in the next slide, we'll take a look at the structure and see just how similar they are. Um, and so it incorporates remdesivir into viral RNA strands in place of adenosine. And then uh, the what happens then is because of the chemical differences between uh, remdesivir and adenosine, remdesivir prevents further RNA replication. So it kind of halts viral replication. Now, um, that's easier said than done, particularly in coronaviruses, it turns out. Um, coronaviruses have um, something called an exoribonuclease, and they're sort of, they're basically what they are, are these proofreading enzymes. So they go along and they find errors in the viral RNA and they excise those errors so that they can be repaired uh, and then the virus is unharmed. And that actually makes it difficult to uh, target coronaviruses with anti-metabolite drugs um, like remdesivir. However, it turns out that remdesivir is not affected by um, the proofreading enzymes. And so um, that's one of the criteria for an anti-metabolite to be affected in coronaviruses. So um, remdesivir really has threaded a, a needle there in terms of therapeutic efficacy. The other thing that's important to note is that it's highly selective for the viral RNA polymerases. It does not seem to like human RNA polymerases. Um, so you don't get a lot of toxicity in humans, which of course is also important since we're trying to treat a disease that's in humans at the moment. All right, so let's take a look now at the structure of remdesivir and compare it to the structure of adenosine. So here is uh, remdesivir and um, here is adenosine. So at first glance, um, you might see some similarities there. Um, there's definitely a lot of similarities. Let's walk through some of those really quickly. Um, to start off with, um, here you have the adenine base. It's a purine base or a purine-like base. Uh, and that, of course, is one of the base pairs that pairs up with other base pairs to form um, either DNA or RNA. In the case of COVID-19, we'll be talking about RNA, of course. Uh, next is the ribose back, uh, backbone. And so, again, you can see similar structure there. They both have a kind of a ribose-like backbone. And then um, also, similarly, are the... Um, phosphate or phosphate-like groups. Um, in the case of adenosine monophosphate, you actually have one um, phosphate group. In the case of remdesivir, that's a phosphamide group. Um, and it turns out that remdesivir is actually a prodrug. So that entire phosphamide group there is a leaving group. It's, it's actually cleaved off. Um, and then um, remdesivir undergoes phosphorylation and, and has a, a monophosphate form and ultimately a triphosphate form. And that's what gets incorporated into viral RNA. So um, a similarity, but also a difference. So let's take a look at some of the other differences between these two molecules. So going back to the um, adenine or the purine-like base, again, if you take a look at the arrangement of the nitrogen atoms in that dual ring structure there, um, you'll see that there's obviously some um, significant differences in the way that the nitrogen atoms are arrayed. Um, another significant difference, of course, is um, this nitrile group coming off of the ribose. And so remdesivir has that nitrile group. Adenosine, of course, does not. So those structural differences are responsible for um, the mechanism that we just discussed and some of the, the changes and uh, the, the way that the um, molecule essentially gums up the viral polymerases. So now that we've reviewed the mechanism of action of remdesivir, let's take a look at what the efficacy data shows us. And we'll start off with the preclinical data. So um, in vitro, remdesivir has shown pretty significant activity against a variety of uh, different virus types, including coronaviruses. Um, it was shown to have significant activity against SARS and MERS, uh, and that's what grabbed people's interest in terms of COVID-19. Uh, both SARS and MERS are very similar um, to the clinical presentation of COVID-19, um, but not as infectious, not as widespread. Um, in addition, um, Remdesivir was found to be active against a number of other SARS-like coronaviruses that cause uh, disease in humans or that are thought to potentially be able to cause disease in humans. So a lot of interest there. Um, and of course, once the COVID-19 um, crisis started, um, data was quickly generated that demonstrated that yes, um, remdesivir was also effective against the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, that causes COVID-19. Um, 
Remdesivir was shown to inhibit viral replication. Again, if you look at the mechanism we discussed, that makes perfect sense. Um, it does not affect viral entry into cells. Um, someone actually took a look at that. Uh, and again, that makes sense when you think about the mechanism. It really doesn't um, do anything at all to stop the virus from getting into the cells. But once they're there, it prevents the uh, replication of viral RNA. In mouse models of SARS, uh, which is, again, somewhat similar to COVID-19, SARS, of course, is the original um, pulmonary disease that was described in the early 2000s, um, remdesivir improved lung function, it reduced severe lung injury, and it also reduced um, viral loads. Again, this is in a mouse model of SARS, so not humans. Um, so, um, again, pretty exciting preclinical data. Um, and it's a little bit of an extrapolation to assume that that same benefit um, that you see in mice would also be seen in mice with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so whether that's true or not, we don't know just yet. Um, so now the next question comes up, is there any efficacy data in humans? Uh, and it turns out that there's some. So let's take a look at the clinical efficacy. So this is a case report um, looking at the first US COVID-19 case. So this was a 35-year-old male who had traveled to Wuhan, China, um, and he presented initially with a cough and a fever for four days um, prior to coming to the hospital. His past medical history was significant only for hypertriglyceridemia, and he was a non-smoker. He had no other significant past medical history. Um, on exam, he was found to have ronchi on lung auscultation, but otherwise his uh, physical exam was completely normal. His chest x-ray showed no uh, abnormalities, so um, that's the chest x-ray that was um, from the article. Um, very normal looking chest x-ray uh, there, if, you're, if you happen to be um, familiar with chest x-rays. Um, a viral respiratory panel, which it's important to point out did not include SARS-CoV-2, um, was negative, so he had no uh, evidence of viral respiratory infection. Based on the travel warning and the news coming out of China, um, they decided to send off for a COVID-19 uh, test. And so uh, it turns out the next day um, they received uh, confirmation that this patient was in fact COVID-19 positive. So at that time, um, they decided to admit the hospital for observation. He wasn't having clinical symptoms that warranted admission, um, but it was more out of an abundance of caution at that point. Um, so the patient was stable on days two through four of hospitalization. The only thing that's interesting to note is that he had some GI, mild GI distress. He had some loose bowel movements on day two and day three. And I point that out um, for a reason. You'll see what that is in the next slide. Um, it's not uncommon for patients with COVID-19 to report um, GI issues, whether that's you know, loose bowel movements, diarrhea, um, and also including nausea and uh, vomiting uh, on occasion. So that seems to be part of the clinical course of COVID-19 for some patients. So on the evening of day five, um, the chest x-ray shows consolidation in the left lower lobe. The chest x-ray that I show here is actually from day six. Um, I, it was just a more impressive chest x-ray, so which is why I selected it. Um, but you can clearly see signs of pneumonia there in the bases and then in the posterior, um, closer to the spine. Um, there's, there's very clearly some consolidations there, so clear evidence of pneumonia. Um, and this also coincided with uh, decreasing oxygenation. So the patient's O2 sats fell to 90% on room air. Um, so again, we're seeing a clinical correlation with the chest X-ray finding. Um, so the hospital started the process of getting remdesivir um, on, day, on hospital day six. They were, were able to work through all the paperwork and actually get the drug, and they started that on day seven. So um, they administer the drug on day seven, and on day eight, the patient's clinical condition begins to improve, and the report ends on hospital day 11. Um, at, on hospital day 11, the patient is a febrile. Um, all his symptoms except for the cough have resolved, and the cough is uh, decreasing in severity. So phenomenal, right? It looks like the remdesivir worked. Well, not so fast. Um, keep in mind, this is a case report in a single patient, and we can't go back and see what would have happened if we didn't give this patient remdesivir. So um, it's entirely possible that the improvement that was noted had nothing to do with remdesivir, and that this is the clinical course this patient's disease would have had even if they hadn't received remdesivir. So it's not entirely fair to uh, attribute the improvement in symptoms to remdesivir without appropriate controls. Um, what we can say is that the patient did better, um, and that's about the extent of it. Um, 
So then what else do we have? Well, there's another case series of the first 12 COVID-19 patients in the US. Um, and this is from an article that has not been peer reviewed. So I'll just point that out. So take it with the appropriately sized grain of salt. Um, and um, this was put together by a team um, comprised of a number of uh, folks from the US uh, CDC. Um, so of the first 12 COVID-19 patients, three patients out of the 12 were treated with remdesivir and they received remdesivir for somewhere between four to 10 days. All the patients had transient GI symptoms um, upon receiving remdesivir. Um, some had nausea, vomiting, gastroparesis, and one patient experienced rectal bleeding. Um, it's important to note, however, that one patient had traveled to Mexico prior to um, their COVID-19 diagnosis and later on in their clinical course, their stool ended up testing positive for Giardia and C. diff, and that was also the patient with the rectal bleeding. So um, difficult to say whether that was related to remdesivir or the fact that this individual clearly had some GI bugs. Um, also, again, the reason I pointed out on the previous slide, the GI issues, again, it's difficult to tease out whether these GI symptoms are from the COVID-19 disease course. Again, as I mentioned, that's not it's not uncommon for patients to have GI symptoms or whether this was a result of the uh, the drug itself. So uh, remdesivir was discontinued after improvement in all patients and their uh, respiratory symptoms improved. So all the patients recovered, they all seem to do well. So again, um, remdesivir works, right? Well, again, we can't tell. This is a case series. Um, we don't know what would have happened had remdesivir not been given to these patients. So uh, we really can't draw any conclusions. It's not randomized in any way, shape, or form. So um, there are a number of clinical trials right now that have been initiated to answer that question. So we're doing these properly so that there are controls so that we can answer the question. And so there will likely be more information available shortly. Unfortunately, it's not available yet. Um, so one question we've been getting is how, where can you get remdesivir? Um, well, the best answer is clinical trials. So if your institution is participating in a clinical trial, identify who the primary investigator is and ask them how to refer or enroll patients. If your institution is not participating, um, there are many large multi-center trials that have been started right now. So um, consider joining um, as a participating center. A, you'll get access to remdesivir, and B, um, you can help us all answer the questions that we're trying to answer. Uh, and the more quickly we can get this information out there, um, the more quickly we can all benefit from that knowledge. Uh, the other way is through an expanded access program through Gilead. Um, however, um, at the moment, as of April 2nd, it looks like that's on hold. They're kind of redesigning the program um, because of the um, extent of the COVID-19 crisis. They're trying to figure out how to get everybody drug who would like drug, um, and they, if they're even able to do that. I don't know what their supply is like. So for the most up-to-date inf information, check out the link on the slide. That's the best source of information um, and will be more up-to-date than <laughs> what you're going to hear about in this presentation. So what's the bottom line? Um, should we be recommending remdesivir for COVID-19? The answer is has so often been the case is it's too soon to tell. Um, in vitro and animal data show great promise, but keep in mind they did for Ebola as well and it didn't pan out. Remdesivir didn't pan out for Ebola. Um, available clinical data are descriptive only and the number of available cases is really small. I mean, we're talking about four patients so far where we've actually had a good description of the, the clinical course. Um, so the drug, we do know that the drug is well tolerated and that's from the Ebola experience. So we, there are, have been a significant number of patients who've received remdesivir. So it's relatively safe that we can say with confidence. Um, however, and as, as I mentioned, there are um, a number of clinical trials going on. And so more data is expected as those, um, the ongoing trials continue to enroll and as the data mature. So um, with that, that will wrap up um, our 15 on COVID-19 session for today. Um, if you have questions about COVID-19, please email us at covided at aphanet.org. We've received a lot of great suggestions so far. So thank you to those of you who have already submitted. We encourage you to submit your questions so that we can um, plan future episodes of um, 15 on COVID-19. Our next episode of COVID-19 will be released on Monday. And that will be talking about the role of IL-6 um, antagonists in managing some of the more severe symptoms of COVID-19 disease. So we hope to see you on Monday. Thank you all. Stay safe, and we hope you have a great weekend.